Well, hello, Bible Baptist Church. Welcome to Church at Home. Uh, I know this is a surreal time for us as we're trying to navigate the best we can uh, through the circumstances that are in the world today. Um, so here I am. I've got my Cafe 1031 mug, and uh, I'm ready to, to have a conversation with you this morning and uh, just thrilled that you, you tuned in. And um, certainly being in prayer uh, for all that's taking place uh, in the world today, in our community, and certainly in our church as well. So um, welcome. Uh, I believe that somewhere in this last week, you've been triggered. And, it, and it's interesting that we have our sermon series called Triggered. And um, incidentally, if you uh, show up on Sunday morning uh, and you didn't get the word, um, someone will be here. We'll have that awkward conversation with you. I'm very sorry, um, but there'll be plenty of space and uh, glad for you to come in. But uh, hopefully you did get the word and, and you're home and uh, you're enjoying uh, this sermon together. As I said, we've been talking about triggered and, and, and chances are you've been triggered here in, in uh, recent days. And, and, and it could be many different things that caused you to be triggered. Uh, I mean, maybe you went to the grocery store and uh, right like this guy right here, there was no toilet paper. What am I going to do? How are we going to manage? Uh, perhaps, perhaps you were just brokenhearted when you realized that they canceled every sporting activity. No final four. I mean, you're, you're this guy with a big tear rolling down your cheek. How, how are we going to handle this? How are we going to move forward? Um, maybe you, you, you took a second to look at your IRA and uh, you see what the stock market's doing and it, and it caused you to, to be triggered and concerned and worried about you know, your future and how fast it's dropping and you might have lost a quarter of, of what you had in there just as a result of what's going on with the virus and, and so you, you've certainly felt triggered. Um, maybe you were trigger, triggered because you got our announcement uh, that, that we are not going to be able to meet together as a church for two weeks. And, and I realize, I realize that that's a difficult thing. Um, we, we are not going to minimize um, the seriousness of, uh, of making a decision like that. And I also know that, that all of you are welcome to, to your opinion on, on, on how you believe we as a church should handle that. And, and I'm sure some of you, um, somewhere on Thursday, were thinking, come on, where's the, where's the announcement? Why don't I have more information? This is serious. We need to address it. And, and we understand, but we wanted to make a, a cautious and prudent decision. Uh, others of you, when we made the decision, may have felt a little frustrated. You may have thought, come on, we, we are not to have a spirit of fear, but of love and a sound mind. And, and, and we're kind of feeding into the fear mongering right now. And, and why did we make this decision? And, and, and again, we understand, we understand that there is an overemphasis right now on the virus and that, that fear is running a lot of this. And, and, and I want you to know something. Um, in no way has your leadership responded out of fear. Your, your leadership has responded in ways that we think are responsible and considerate. We, we believe that we're to prefer others. And, and during this time, we, we know that some are probably a little bit more susceptible to danger if they were to contract the virus. And so we wanted to, um, to love them and to protect them as best we could. And, and honestly, a lot of it came down to Romans 13's admonition that, that we as the church um, that, that, that we should do the best we can, if possible, if it doesn't go against God's word, to, to obey our authorities, our local authorities, our state authorities, our civil authorities, our federal authorities. And after Governor Wolf um, asked that, that groups of 250 um, no longer meet together and, and that we do the best we can to kind of uh, let this virus die out, um, we thought in, an, in a heart of cooperation um, that we should adhere to that. And we think that that's a good testimony to the community. And so we, we made that, that difficult decision. Here, here's what I can tell you. And this is, should be an encouragement to all of us. God works in the messes. Um, this is something we never could have seen uh, a month ago. This is something we, w we wouldn't have even thought of uh, as far as canceling services uh, several days ago. And yet, here we are. And, and I know it's frustrating. I know it can be challenging. But we are going to find where God's working. And we're going to join him. 
You know, Romans 8, 28 says, all things work together for good to those that are love God and are called according to his purpose. So we're gonna try to find the good in this. We're going to um, be connecting with you in many different ways throughout this, this uh, season of a break. And um, so we're going to um, try to find online ways to connect with you. We're going to certainly uh, look for ways that we can minister to the community. We're gonna look for ways that we can minister to each other um, during this significant time. Um, We are um, saved and set up for times like this as the church of Jesus Christ. And so we're gonna press into it. We're gonna press into the confusion and we're gonna ask God to do great things and to teach us great things as we go about this. You know, Peter addressed the church in 1 Peter 3.8. And when he addressed the church, he wanted to encourage them that this is not a time for, for, for disunity. This isn't a time to, to go all triggered, right? But instead, here's how we should respond as a church. And I hope that, that we could take this uh, and kind of apply it to our situation today. Finally, all of you. And this is our prayer. We, we realize that we may not have uniformity in all the decisions that were made and, and all the circumstances that are going on right now, but, but we're asking for all of you to go ahead and follow these steps. Finally, all of you, church, have unity. We don't have to have uniformity. Perhaps you would have done things a different way, or perhaps um, for some, they're taking the virus a little bit more serious than others. It's okay, but we can have unity. We must have unity. Have unity of mind, right? Let's have one mind. God, where are you working? How can we serve you? How can we be the church out there if we can't gather in here? One mind. Sympathy. Let's have sympathy for for those that are at the highest risk. Make sure that we're reaching out. Make sure that we're leaning towards them with love and compassion and serving them in any way that we possibly can. Brotherly love. We can love each other. Don't condemn or be critical of one another. A tender heart. Um, This is a time where the world needs to see us in action, having tender hearts. And a humble mind. Um, we can be humble. We can realize that there are different perspectives, different ways to handle this, and in unity, join together for the glory of God. And I know that we're gonna do that, church, and really, that kind of ties into what we're gonna talk about today. I I think that it would be very prudent for us to have a conversation on fear, because the world is certainly feeling fearful right now. Perhaps you, honestly, are feeling a bit fearful right now. And so we'd like to address that. What does the Bible say about fear? Fear. Well, to be honest with you, the Bible says that we're to fear less, fearless. And so we see that fear is not necessarily a sin. It's not wrong to fear. God has given us the ability to fear. It saves our lives in many instances. It's a good thing that we have fear, but we're to fear less. In other words, when it turns into worry, when it turns into unhelpful fear, you see the fear that God gives us naturally is adrenaline. The fear that God gives us naturally is, is, is the fear that allows us to, to move. It moves us. It pushes us in a direction. It's not paralyzing. Uh, It's not something that causes us to sin. And so what we realize is because we're created in the image of God, fear is a part of God's perfect design for us. He's given us the ability to, to, to worship. He's given us the ability to have awe. And, and animals don't necessarily have the same way in which we would fear. Um, they, they, they don't have imaginations. We have imaginations and our imaginations are connected to our fears because we're able to imagine things that frighten us and that they take us to, to places we didn't necessarily want to go. You know, um, fear can help us in certain circumstances. If you're driving a car and all of a sudden a deer jumps out your adrenaline kicks in, you, you, you become a bit afraid and you, you swerve your car just the right way to avoid the deer. Perhaps save your life. Um, I was thinking of my brother-in-law the other day. Um, we went, well, it was a couple years ago, several years ago now, we went to the vet 
um, to watch an Eagles game. And he's a big Dallas Cowboy fan. And typically, he wears his Dallas colors and shirts loud and proud. But when he went to the vet for an Eagles game, out of self-preservation, he made sure that he didn't wear his Dallas shirt. He went because he had a proper form of fear, just incognito. And, uh, and, and I think that he was wise to do that. So, so fear can absolutely protect you. Um, fear, what is it? Well, it's a byproduct of our ability to project into the future and also to remember our past. Um, two days ago, I walked our dog. And when we got home, I found four ticks crawling on our dog. And believe it or not, that causes me to be fearful. Because several years ago, I had the worst case of Lyme's disease. I mean, I was a sick puppy. And I'll tell you what, when I see a tick now, it, it, it causes me to act. I, I, I recoil a little bit. I, I worry a little bit. And, and, and the reason is because I have this past situation that feeds into what could happen in the future. And all of us have this natural experience that causes us to fear, that causes us to be a bit afraid. And so, as our imagination begins to fire, we begin to worry. And sometimes I know it's not rational. Rational. I mean, even from the time we're little kids, we have these irrational fears. Um, we worry about the fact that there's a monster under our bed or that there's one in the closet. A and it's completely irrational because if the closet door is shut, we know the rules. The monster can't get out and get us, right? If there's a monster under your bed and you keep all your limbs in the bed, none of them hang out, you're going to be fine. He won't get you. But if one pops over the edge, look out. It could be dangerous. And the foolish thing is, is when we're afraid, where's the first place we hide? Under the bed, exactly where the monster is. So we realize that a lot of times, even from our young age, all the way up till now, where you look at our world in this circumstance with the coronavirus, and you see fear that is... It's not fully founded. Um, sometimes it's, it's, it's completely over the top. But we understand that this is how we experience fear at times. So we, we fear what might happen, what could happen, and not necessarily what is happening and where are we. For some of you, you truly do have a fear. What if I get the virus? I, I don't have a strong immune system right now. What, what if my child would get it and they're young and, and susceptible to these types of things? And we have proper fears and concerns. Others, it's, it's man, what, what, if my, what if my savings continues to, to, to be depleted? I, I was counting on this for retirement. I was counting on that extra money and, and now things are gonna be tight and I'm concerned. Some of you, you may have small businesses and, and you're concerned about, frankly, the climate in which your services are gonna be needed or, or when you're even going to be able to get the supplies that you need to be able to be effective in a community. And, and there's real economic fears that you're experiencing right now. A lot of moms are wondering, how in the world are we going to survive with all of our kids home, with no school? I mean, legitimate fear. How am I going to pay my bills? How am I going to handle all of these things? Jesus, well, he explains to us how we're to handle our fears. And he does it in very succinct ways. If you were to say, Lord, I'm afraid. What should I do when I'm afraid? He would say this. Fear not. <laughs> you say, God, I, I need more than that. I'm really concerned with what's going on right now. And he would say, listen, don't be afraid. Well, 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 I am afraid. Have no fear. But no, no, no. Let not your heart be troubled. You see, these are all phrases that he used with his disciples. When his disciples were, were thrown into uncomfortable, dangerous, scary, confusing places, Jesus calmed them with very simple words. Men, don't be afraid. Men, 
let not your heart be troubled. I, I, I know things are changing. I know I just told you I'm going away. I know that I said that, that one of you is going to betray me. I, I, I know I'm sending you out on a mission that, that's bigger than you. I, I know the storms are big and scary. Don't be afraid. Don't fear. You know, it really ties in to, to a passage of scripture in Matthew chapter 10, um, where he is preparing his disciples. He's, he's testing his disciples to get them ready for the, for the time where he ascends up into heaven and, and, and they are to carry the mission that Jesus started. And, and in preparation, he's bringing them through testing. He's bringing them through trial. He's, he's allowing them to experience ministry and he's discipling them to do that ministry. And in, and in Matthew 10, they, they, they in, in the chapter before, are going to city to city and they're watching Jesus. And Jesus is moving towards the crowds and he's healing them. And then he's teaching the gospel to them and asking them to repent and to believe in him. And, and, and people are getting saved and people are getting healed. And this is an amazing time of power. And then they also notice Jesus' compassion and how he's crying for the community. And he's seeing a community in fear. He's seeing a community that's frustrated. He's seeing a community that, that wants to be out of Roman rule. They're seeing a community that doesn't know how to have eternal life or that they're trying to obey the law, but they're missing the bigger picture. And Jesus' heart is broken. And so he's saying, now guys, you've watched me do discipleship. We're gonna take a little missions trip. And on this journey, on this little missions trip journey, I'm gonna divide you up. I'm gonna divide you up and you're gonna have a partner and I'm gonna send you out into the world and you're gonna go where I tell you to go and you're gonna try to find and witness to and share who I am and how to be saved with, with other Jews that God has prepared to hear this good news. And so they went out and he goes, but, but here's the caveat. When you go out, there's going to be persecution. I'm sending you out like sheep to wolves. And many of you, many of you, as you go out, you're, 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 you're going to suffer. You're, you're going to have persecution. Some of you will die. All right, you ready? Let's go. And, and that is, is the scene in which Jesus shares this passage of scripture. We're gonna look at Matthew 10, starting in verse 26. Matthew 10, starting in verse 26, he says, so have no fear of them, for nothing is covered that will not be revealed or hidden that will not be known. What I tell you in the dark, say in the light. And what you hear whispered, proclaim on the housetops. So how does he start this out? He says, so have no fear. Don't fear them. Don't fear those that could persecute you. Don't fear them. And, and what's the them in your life? Well, today we could easily say, well, the them is, is, is the virus, right? The them is how people are responding to the virus. They're, they're, the them is my, my IRA right now. There's a lot of different thems that we could put in that place. Perhaps, perhaps the, the, the them and the worry that you have right now is the fact I had to leave college early and I just started a relationship and now I don't know if that relationship's gonna move forward and, and maybe I'll never get married. I, I have this worry, I have this fear. Well, well, they had worries and fears. They had them to be worried about. But Jesus said, so have no fear of them for nothing is covered that will not be revealed or hidden that will not be known. He's saying, listen, I'm, I'm, going to, I'm going to supply the words that you need. I'm going to supply the comfort that you need. I am going to make sure that, that you realize that you're not going to be left alone, that you're not going to be forsaken. What I tell you in the dark, say in the light. He's saying, I want you to be bold. I, I'm telling you this, and I'm going to send you out into the dark, and, 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 I'm, and, and I want you to speak this truth and, and that's a good lesson for all of us. You know, in this time of confusion, in this time of fear in our world, we have a message of peace. We have a message of hope. We have a savior that's in control. And this is a time not to, not to recede, but instead to press towards those that need to hear this message, to be bold, um, not to be ashamed of the gospel. And so he says, say it in the light and what you hear whispered, proclaim on the housetops. Be bold, be bold with this message and I would employ you to do the same. Next. And do not fear those who kill the body 
wait a minute, Lord, killing the body is a pretty big deal. <laughs> I, I'm a little worried about that. I, 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 I think if they kill the body, they pretty much got all of me, right? But, but he's saying, hey, listen, don't fear those that can kill the body, right? But d- don't let them have your all. Don't, don't be so afraid of them that you forget to obey God. Don't be so afraid of them that you don't listen to my commandments and my words to you. He said, don't be afraid of those who the killed body but cannot kill the soul. Rather, rather fear him who can destroy both soul and body in hell. He's saying, listen, one thing should have your awe. One thing should have your worship. It is not a coronavirus. It, it, it is not your financial situation. It is not the struggles that you have in this life. It's not the persecution that's around the corner. It's not the struggle that's waiting for you. What should have your all is the one who is the resurrection and the life. What should have your all is your heavenly father who's a good father and and sovereignly will test you and sovereignly will send you even into dangerous places. And so we see this challenge to them. Are not two sparrows sold for a penny? And he's saying, listen, sparrows aren't that, they're not that expensive. They're not even that important. And yet, he says, next, and not one of them will fall to the ground apart from your father. And so he's saying, listen, sparrows matter to God. And so do you, much more so. And and, and we'll we'll get back to, to that part of this conversation in just a little bit. But Jesus, you know, this wasn't the first time that he was encouraging the disciples not to be afraid. It wasn't the first time that that he was letting them know that that your heavenly father, he has the final say. And and yes, bad things happen. He he didn't say that the, the sparrow would never fall. He says the opposite, they will fall. Sparrows will fall. They will have tragic challenges. And and, and so will you. You will have unfair situations. Senseless things will happen. But they do not happen apart from your heavenly father's plan. He knows us completely. It says here that he knows the hairs of your head are all numbered. Fear not, therefore, you are more value than many sparrows. He's saying, listen, a sparrow isn't gonna fall without God knowing it, and you're way more valuable to me than a sparrow. You're way more valuable to your heavenly father, Jesus is saying to the disciples at this time. Your, Your heavenly father knows. Your heavenly father cares. And so this doesn't happen apart from his plan. He has a plan. He knows completely the hairs on your head. He, he, he knows the tears that you cry. And he's there. He loves you deeply. You, you are much more valuable to him than anything else that he's created. You see, what Jesus is doing is he's redirecting the, the why question Why should we go out and do this? Why do we need to be bold? Why do these bad things happen? Why is there persecution? And instead he's directing it to a who. The question isn't why bad things happen, but but who is with you when they happen? And who authored these things to happen? In this passage, you're gonna see that there's an imperative. And the imperative is this. Don't be afraid. Several times in the passage we just read, Christ said that at least three or four. Don't be afraid. Don't be afraid. Fear not. But then there's an indicative. And that what's an indicative? It's a statement of fact. Why shouldn't I be afraid, Jesus? Why? I am with you. Not not that I'll explain it to you, but I'm with you. And this is something that, that, that Jesus, time and time again, was trying to get through the disciples' heads. As a matter of fact, he used a boat ride as a visual. 
And, and we talked about it several, several months ago um, on a Sunday morning. And, and, and it's two chapters before this chapter, Matthew 10. In Matthew 8, he, he, he is training the disciples. And, and what he did is they all got in a boat after uh, the crowds were pressing in because Christ was um, pro- providing all of these miracles and, and, and serving people in such a mighty way. And the gospel message was catching hold. And he's like, we have to retreat. We have to get away from the, the crowds right now. And so they got into a boat. And, and you know the story. They, they, they float out into the sea and, and why they're there in the sea, all of a sudden the, the winds come up, right? And, and they're triggered. The Sea of Galilee all of a sudden is a terrifying place to be. This storm is so unbelievable. And, and it says that the disciples became sore afraid, right? Suddenly afraid. And they look over at Jesus and what is he doing? Jesus is sleeping. And, and then they, they wake him up and, and Jesus, he, he chides them. Why don't you have faith? I'm in the boat with you. Nothing's going to go wrong. And Jesus calms the storm. And when he calms the storm, it says that they were filled with fear. And, the, and, and they used the very Greek word that is a noun for fear and a verb for fear. So they were, they were filled in every way, in every aspect. They had fear, not of the storm anymore, but of the one that was in the boat, of Jesus. And Jesus is, is letting them know, listen, you don't have to be afraid of what's out there. You need to have an all for me. Your all needs to be fully and completely towards me. You know, a little while later, two chapters after this one, he, so before he sends them out into persecution, he has this boat ride and he encourages them. Then he sends them out on this trip and then he lets them know that that's going to continue for a while. And then in Matthew 14, 22, Jesus again has them near water. And he says, hey guys, get in the boat. And this time they're like, no, nah, I'm not getting in the boat. We, we know what happens when we get in the boat. And it literally says that he made them get in the boat. All right, get in the boat. And, and, and he kind of pushes them out to sea and they're floating away and he's kind of waving. See you boys, right? Ho- hope everything goes well out there. And sure enough, the headwind comes and the waves start going again and it gets very, very choppy. And, and what does Jesus do? He, he, he begins to walk on the water and he's walking towards them. And as he's coming towards them, they're, they're, they're again, super afraid. What are we going to do? It's a ghost. A ghost is coming towards us. And then they heard him speak. And, and it says, but Jesus immediately said, that's, that's what the passage says. Jesus immediately said to them, right? And, and what did Jesus say? Did he say, you failures, you, you bunch of losers. Here we are in another boat with another storm. And what are you? You're afraid again. No, that's, that's not what he said. He says, take heart, guys. Do not be afraid. I'm here. Yes, I wasn't in the boat with you, but I'm always watching. I'm always here. I always know. And that's true of whatever situation we're in. He, he's here. He's always watching. He always knows. He's always engaged in our fears and in our concerns. Guys, I, I, I may not always be here on this earth with you, but I will always be there. Your heavenly father, he's always watching. He always knows. You know, some of you enjoy taking tests. You're you're, you're like the kid that's like, teacher, teacher, by the way, didn't you say we were supposed to have a pop quiz today? Yeah, you forgot, right? I I don't understand you people. I I hate taking tests. When I was a child, I would would not test well. I'd freeze up. I'd get nervous. Till this day, if I see a number two pencil and a Scantron, I I, I break out in a cold sweat, right? I'm not a good tester. And so maybe you're the type of person that likes to be tested, or maybe you're the type of person that does not like to be tested. But here's one thing I know. All of us, like things that have been tested, right? We're we're all glad that someone tested a product that we bring home. We are all glad the pilots are tested. We all appreciate the fact that doctors have been tested. Why? Because we need them. We need to make sure that they are ready, that they're prepared. We all have appreciated things that are tested. And what Jesus is doing with his disciples is he's preparing them. He's preparing them for when he leaves this earth and he gives them the mission. 
He's testing them. And I would say Bible Baptist Church right now and in our church history, 2010, 2020, in this moment, we're up to a test. God is, a, is allowing things to take place that are, that are causing us to have to do extraordinary, unusually um, different things than, than our normal everyday pace. And, 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 and how, how are we going to move forward? I, I hope with grace, I hope with wisdom, I hope with trust. Jesus here is preparing his, his disciples. And, and you know what? As he's preparing his disciples, he's doing it in such a way um, that, that step by step, they're starting to get it. Step by step, they're making improvements. But they continue to be a fearful group. All the way till the very end, right? They arrest Jesus. And what do the disciples do? Well, they don't fear the one that they're supposed to fear. Instead, they fear the it, that is death. And they run and they scurry and they hide. And and, and they don't know what to do. And, And they didn't become courageous, quite frankly, until when? Until they saw the resurrected Savior. Then, then they were no longer afraid. You see, the resurrection, it causes us to be, to be fearless. They, they, were, they were afraid of who could harm the body. They were afraid of death. They were afraid of all the bad things that could happen. But when they saw a resurrected Savior and they knew that death had lost, that he had won, they were no longer afraid. They became the boldest group of men ever. Proclaiming the gospel, leaning into wherever God sent them. You see, when they lost their fear of death, they became literally fearless. And praise the Lord, we can look back at the cross. Praise the Lord, we also know that our heavenly father watches us and that Jesus Christ conquered the grave and that Jesus Christ has provided everlasting life for us. What is it you fear that a risen Savior, that a risen Savior hasn't already remedied, hasn't already taken care of with the resurrection? Your your sin conquered, death destroyed. We can be bold even in the face of danger as the church of Jesus Christ. Why? Because a someone replaced a something. And we can have all, more all for that someone than whatever the something is that is causing you fear today, that is causing you challenge at this time. You know, I have a friend, his name's Wade. Um, Wade has ALS and, and, and it's, it's attacking his motor neurons. And slowly but surely he is preparing to meet his maker. And it is a tremendous robber of everything from him. And I've watched him slowly decay over the years, but he is an inspiring man of faith. He has an amazing attitude. Even though he's slowly going to meet his maker and even though things that we take for granted every day, like walking, like swallowing, right? That, 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 that we wouldn't even think about have been taken away from him. He refuses to give up on life. And even though his body is giving up on him, he is trusting Christ through it all. And, and it's an amazing thing to watch. And, and um, the other day, I, uh, every first uh, game of the year, um, one of the pastors at, at the church, Calvary Monument, that he attends, um, would take him to see the Phillies game on first day. And, and, and to be honest with you, the last Phillies game that we took him to, uh, he, he, he lost his, his bowels at the game. And he said, guys, I'm never gonna go to another baseball game. This is over. And, and he was a little bit discouraged for a second, but then he bounced back very quickly and he started serving again. And I, and, and I said, wait, how do you do it? How do you do it day in and day out as, as, as you're, you're, you're slowly diminishing? And he goes, well, the first thing I've decided to do is, is to hang out with positive people or people who could need a friend or some perspective. 
And so he would, he would hang out with, with people that would, would not, not pity him, people that would not always talk in, in sad tones, but, but people that were positive, people that were uplifting. That's who he wanted to be with. And whoever needed a hand. There were so many times as a pastor, I would walk into the hospital room and, and I would go, hey, I'm here to visit you. And they'd say, oh, you just missed Wade. He was here. He, he would beat me to almost every single needy person at the church and pray with them and serve them and love them. It was unbelievable to watch how he, although had much to be afraid of, pushed it aside and saw a mission, saw a purpose, saw a reason. He also explained that, that, that another thing that would help him and encourage him is, is the sooner that he accepted what couldn't be changed, it was easier for him to move forward. And what he basically was saying is this, Brian, I slayed my idols and I gave them to the Lord. And when fear comes into our lives, I think our idols are most evident. The things that we serve, the things that we love, the things that we want to hold on to the most, we, 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 we become obsessed over. And, and slowly but surely, he had to give up all of those things. Even things like going to a Pirates game on first day. He, he had to slowly give up um, understanding that, that he wouldn't be able to provide for his family and go to work. He had to give up different aspects of, of his own health and, and things that he enjoyed like mowing the grass. And as he gave up these idols, he, he said, I have to accept that this is God's plan for my life and I know that God loves me so much. He wrote a daily blog, still does, every morning to encourage others, to, to challenge them in their fears and their difficulties. He said, you know, the neat thing about being a Christian is that there's no mystery how this thing ends. It ends with me in heaven, in a perfect body. It ends with me whole. And that's where his awe factor went to. I am in awe of a God who saved me. I am in awe in a God who prepared a way for me to go through this trial, yes. Not in a way that I become overwhelmed with fear and overwhelmed with worry, but in a way that I can help others, in a way that I can minister to others. And he said that the unknown isn't ever really unknown for a Christian. We know the end, and that makes all the difference. Let not your heart be troubled. I go to prepare a place for you. Jesus said this to the disciples, and I want to encourage you in the same way. You see, someone has overcome something so that we could have everything. And in times like this, where fear is close, I trust and pray that you'll turn to the Savior and you will fear him more than the circumstances. And that you don't stop serving, you don't stop going out on mission, but instead you run into the messes knowing that he'll never abandon you. He's always there. So, Bible Baptist Church, we're in a test. We're, we're sent out on mission. How will we fear less together? Well, number one, the way that we're going to do that is by prioritizing our fear. We're, we're going to make sure that our fear is not overtaking us, but instead the one that is over fear, the one that has conquered all, has our all. And we're going to follow him. See, our fears with eternal perspective, they're temporal. They've been conquered by a risen Savior. And we're going to speak and live with a holy boldness. We are going to go out into the community and where there is a need, church, we're going to run towards it. 
We're gonna do everything that we can to meet it. And we're gonna ask you to help support these things. I do not have the answers of what that looks like. I don't know exactly what we're going to be doing next week, but here's what I can tell you. I am praying every day that God gives us opportunities as a church to serve, to minister, and to be bold. And we wanna make sure that we are living the gospel and sharing the gospel, not in a spirit of fear, but in love and a sound mind. And I know that you're ready to step up to that challenge with us. And so we will keep you posted on ways, tangible ministry ways that we can move towards our community. We're gonna um, have this holy boldness, which really kind of connects with John 16, 33. And it says this, I have said these things to you, that in me, you may have peace. In the world, you will have trouble. Listen, don't be surprised. The virus is here, we understand, but we will have trouble. But take heart, I have overcome the world. We, we, we do not have to be afraid. God is in control. We're also gonna sacrifice with reckless abandon. And, and because of Romans eight twenty eight, we believe we can do that. All things do work together for good. And so I don't know what those good things are going to be, but as a church, we are going to be sanctified and we are going to grow even as a result of this climate that we're living in right now. Um, and then secondly, we're going to trust our Father, our Heavenly Father. You know, God has the final say. Our God is an immutable God. He doesn't change. He's the same yesterday, today, and forever. And we know that although we live in a, in a mutable world that is always changing and, and things are always topsy-turvy, God remains the same and true and we can count on him. He also rules sovereignly. He is in control of all of this. It came out of his plan and his purpose for us. He knows you completely. He knows your fears he knows the hairs on your head. He knows the tears that you cry. We have a God that is near, that is close, and, and he loves you deeply, more deeply than anyone else could possibly because he knows you fully and you cannot be fully loved until you're fully known. And God knows you better than you know yourself. And he is loving you right now in whatever circumstance you're in, in the most perfect and pure and holy way. You know, what's the imperative? The imperative is this, don't be afraid. Don't be afraid. Joshua 1.9, Isaiah 41.10, all of them challenge us. Don't be afraid, do not fear, do not crumble. But Jesus, as he told the disciples before he ascended into heaven, says this in Matthew 28, 20. Would you look at it with me? He says, teaching them to observe all that I have commanded you. And behold, I am with you always. He is here, church. He is in this. He is serving and ministering. We are his hands and feet. This is a time for action. This is a time for boldness. This is a time for fearlessness, for the glory of God. Because the imperative is don't be afraid. The indicative is this, I am with you. In the difficult days of our lives, we don't have to be afraid. We want answers, but God gives us himself. God gives us his gospel. Isaiah 26, three says this. You keep him in what? In perfect peace, whose mind is stayed on you because he trusts in you. You can have perfect peace by doing what? Having your mind stayed in Christ. By trusting him. God has offered us everything that we need to meet this test. And he admonishes us, don't be afraid. Have the right perspective and know I am with you. You know, Jeremiah 10, five says, talking about idols, it says, their idols are like scarecrows in a cucumber field. 
They can't do anything. They can't scare you. Perhaps you're the type of individual that you're afraid of a scarecrow. Or you're afraid of a clown, right? You see it and, and it causes fear. Ah, right? Well, what he's saying is the birds don't come and get the good stuff because instead they're afraid of these false fears. And in a sense, that's exactly what Jesus said to the disciples. And that's exactly what he wants us to know. There are things out there that look awfully scary. There are things out there that we should be concerned about, but they cannot overwhelm us. And sometimes where the scarecrows are, that's where the greatest fruit is. So let's be bold. Let's walk past whatever scarecrows are out there and let's dive in to the harvest the fruit that God has for us, church. Would you pray with me? Our Heavenly Father, we are so thankful for your word. Lord, we want to respond as Jesus commands us. Fear not. Let's not be worried. Let's not have a spirit of fear. But instead, Lord, let's look for your mission. Let's look for your purpose. And let's boldly be prepared. May we pass this test at this time as Bible Baptist Church, knowing that you are with us. In Jesus' name we pray, amen. Thank you for joining us at Church at Home. We hope to see you very, very soon. Continue to pray for our country, for our church, and for all those that need Jesus Christ as their Lord and Savior. God bless you.